The Holy Grail is one of the most legendary artifacts known to mankind. But does it exist? And if so, where is it? But I do believe that what I have is the original Grail, or at least what started the Grail legend. Whatever the Grail is, the urge to find it is powerful. And across Europe, there are intriguing new discoveries, fresh clues to one of history's most tantalizing puzzles. Situated on the border with Wales, Shropshire is the home to the ruins of Whittington Castle. In the stories where Arthur's knights go searching for the Grail, they find it at somewhere called the White Castle. Now, Whittington Castle, that's actually the word Whittington means white town. Um, and Whittington Castle was called the White Castle. In all the early references to this in the Middle Ages, it is called the White Castle. Some other, other early references to King Arthur's knight searching for the Grail Castle refer to it being in the Old Marches. And that is the name of the marsh area around where Whittington Castle now stands. Looking into the legends surrounding Whittington, Graham Phillips researches a medieval romance named after a local character called Folk Le Fitzwarren. It was written around the same time as the King Arthur tales. And then around about 1200 AD, a story appeared, a romantic story, claiming that the people who lived in this castle, the Fitzwarren family, and there was one called Folk Fitzwarren, was supposed to, supposed to have found this grail. In the story, Fitzwarren is portrayed as a direct descendant of King Arthur and the rightful protector of the Holy Grail. He keeps it in a small chapel adjoining his castle. Then, on his deathbed, he tells his family to hide the treasured cup again. Like the stories based on King Arthur, the romance of Folk Le Fitzwarren might easily be dismissed as nothing more than fantasy. But there is one key difference. Unlike Arthur, whose existence is debatable, Folk Fitzwarren was a definite historical character who lived right here at Whittington. This family, the Fitzwarren family, continued to live at Whittington Castle throughout the Middle Ages and this cup was supposedly passed down through members of the family. The final reference comes in the form of a poem, published in 1855 by a descendant of Folk Fitzwarren under the name Thomas Wright. This family continued to keep this cup in their possession until the last of them, around about 150 years ago, decided that he was going to hide it the poem tells a grail story about a character called the Green Knight. The Green Knight apparently moves the cup from the White Abbey to the vicinity of the Red Castle. This is Hawkstone Park in Shropshire, home to the ruins of the historic Red Castle. The poem ends abruptly before the exact hiding place is revealed. At the bottom of the last page, however, Roman numerals offer a cryptic clue. At the end of the story, he leaves a series of numbers at the, at the end of the poem. Robert Thomas Wright puts a series of numbers there. Graham discusses the puzzle with friends and colleagues. They think the numbers might refer to passages in the Bible. The last words in the poem were the shepherd's songs to guide the way. And it was about this point that somebody else said, wasn't David a shepherd? And so I thought, of course, shepherd songs, the Psalms. For each Roman numeral in the poem, Graham selects the corresponding passage in Psalms. And the first one said, I lift up my eyes unto the hills. And the second one said, lead me to the rock which is higher than I, it was fairly obvious at that moment that we had cracked it. It was clearly leading us from one place to another. But it was the moment that I realized we were, we were on to a kind of modern day Arthurian quest. Standing near the ruins of the Red Castle in Hawkstone Park, Graham begins to follow the clues. The first line reads, I lift up my eyes unto the hills. 
there's only one place that you can lift up your eyes unto the hills, which is a huge great cliff, which is opposite you, known as the White Cliff. It's the highest place for miles around. And the next verse of these psalms in the sequence reads, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Well, this rock on top of the white cliff is certainly got to be the only thing that he could be referring to. Near the top, Graham discovers a series of artificial caves believed to be ancient copper mines used by the Romans. I go into these caves and I start wandering through them and you come out the other side of the, of the hill where the, the, this cliff is and then there's a great big gully in front of you, a, a ravine, a very impressive looking ravine cut out through the rocks. The next verse reads, lead me down the valley, an apparent reference to the ravine he has just discovered. One of the last references to the Psalms says, lead me into the house of the Lord. But when you reach the end of this valley, you reach a church. Well, that is the house of the Lord. So I thought, let's go in to this particular place. Once inside, Graham reads the final passages in the sequence. I turned my eyes to the right and I beheld, and right in front of me is a stained glass window. And it depicts the four gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And they are holding, as you would expect, the books, the gospels that they've written. Except for one of the figures, the one who's supposed to represent St. John, is holding a chalice. I'm thinking, this is strange. Why is he holding a cup? He should be holding a book. Remarkably, Graham learns that the stained glass window was commissioned last century by Thomas Wright, the same man who published the poem with the hidden code. I thought this has got to be the clue that he was leading one to find. So for ages I pondered over what this might mean, why this window was there. The answer to this puzzle lies in the figures above the Gospel writers. A bull, a lion, an angel, and above St. John, the one holding the grail, an eagle. The caves that Graham just walked through once held four statues representing these four figures. And of course, if it's going to be hidden in one of these four statues, it's going to be hidden in the eagle statue because that is the one that's alluded to in the stained glass window. Unfortunately, the statues were removed from the caves in 1920 by this man, Walter Langham. According to a local newspaper article from that year, when the eagle statue was shifted, something unexpected was discovered inside. Graham Phillips is one step closer to a legendary treasure. Graham Phillips is searching for an ancient cup that may have inspired the legend of the Holy Grail. The cup was last hidden here in Hawkstone Park almost 200 years ago. Then in 1920, it surfaced once again. A man named Walter Langham was moving four statues from the park to his home when an accident led to a curious discovery. And he was trying to have them taken down the cliff and the ropes broke and they fell to the bottom and they got smashed up. But when the eagle statue apparently fell to the bottom of the cliff, the base broke off and inside he, he found a small cup. I spent a long time trying to find out what had happened to this cup, had this guy just thrown it away? I mean, he had no idea of its significance. There is only one course of action left. Graham tracks down the great-granddaughter of Walter Langham. Much to his surprise, she is aware of her grandfather's discovery, though she has little idea of its significance. In the attic, she looks through boxes of family artifacts. Graham's anticipation is keen. A 2,000-year-old mystery hangs in the balance. That's it. That's it? That's the one. Do you sure that's, that's it? Yeah, that... that's definitely it. That's what my mother had. Oh, my God. That is incredible. That is remarkable. When I first saw the cup, I thought, 
It's this tiny little thing. I mean, it literally looks like an egg cup. Even though I didn't expect it to be a silver and gold jewel encrusted chalice, I expected it to be a little bit more impressive looking than it is. But the more I thought about it, the more I thought, hold on, if something was possessed by a poor person from first century Palestine, it would have to be something pretty unimpressive. While the cup seems too small to have been used at the Last Supper, Graham believes it does fit the description of another artifact intertwined with Holy Grail lore. In the story of Mary Magdalene, she is supposed to have gone to Jesus' tomb to anoint him with these scents. And it was in this jar that had the scent in it that she was supposed to have collected the blood which then became the, the Marian Chalice, the Grail. There seems to have been sort of two traditions um, fused into one eventually because in, on the one hand you've got Joseph Arimathea who said to have collected the, uh, the Holy Blood. On the other you have the Mary Magdalene. Both have cups. Andrew Collins has been researching historical mysteries like the Holy Grail for more than 20 years. And if I can ask you, if Hoping to learn more about the cup's origins, he accompanies Graham Phillips on a visit to archaeologist Rosemary R. Scott, a specialist in ancient Roman pottery. Let us know what you would feel if you found that on an archaeological dig. Well, the first thing would say it's high status something that is very valuable it would not be the sort of thing you would find with an ordinary person you say high status what exactly does that mean something extremely wealthy i mean all right if an ordinary person had it then it would be something that would be greatly venerated it would be something um, that would be very very valuable but more likely it would be a one-off something that was particularly important particularly valuable What sort of age would you put on that? Um, first century AD. So it's Roman then? Oh, yes, and definitely, yes, definitely. Okay, and what part of the um, empire do you believe it would come from? Most likely the um, Near East. Okay, uh, so we're talking the area of, say, Palestine, Syria? Egypt, that sort of area, And yeah. that sort of area? Yes, okay. yeah. What would it have been used to contain, do you think? The most likely thing, an object like this, would be oils. Something that would, again, be very valuable. It does date to the right time frame of the Age of Christ and does appear to have been fashioned in the very area of the world in which the life of Christ and the Gospels were set down. It's a star that you would associate with um, the Near East. So, um, as far as manufacture is concerned, one would expect it very much to be not originating in England. I was absolutely amazed when I saw it. I thought, wow, you know, this is an absolutely superb looking vessel. My first reactions were, yes, it's probably first century Eastern Mediterranean, onyx, whether it could have been brought direct from the Middle East or whether it could have come via other areas. And again, that's something that is very difficult to determine. So I guess they're, they're questions that one would like to know and probably would never, never know the answer to it. I'm not certain whether or not this cup ever did really belong to Mary Magdalene or it had anything to do with Jesus. Um, it may have done. It may simply have been a tradition that built up over the years. But one thing seems fairly certain, that this is a cup that had been in this family's possession since the Middle Ages from Whittington Castle. And it was Whittington Castle that seems to have been the inspiration behind the Grail Castle in the King Arthur stories. It may or may not have had anything to do with Jesus, but it certainly, in my opinion, is the cup that inspired the romance of the Holy Grail.